Good morning, everyone. Um, as we uh, prepare to worship this morning, I'm going to take a minute and uh, sort of make a, a real life confession. So how many of you actually know what I actually do for a living? I mean, and don't say you're a lawyer, okay, because that's so, that's like saying you're a doctor, but you might be an eye doctor, you might be a GI doctor. How many of you actually know what I do? Or part of what I do? Okay, so a big part of what I do is um, I'm a prosecuting attorney for several municipalities. And what that means is I'm prosecuting people, but a, a big part of that is uh, defense attorneys who come and they need to make a deal for the, the clients they represent. And my confession is this, I have been thinking about this more and more lately, is that I really need God's grace for me to have grace. Uh, I've been practicing law for 32 years, and I'm going to tell you, it is vastly different now than the way it was when I first started. And so where I find myself is, we get, I get these younger attorneys come in who really don't know exactly how to practice, and I'm telling you, God is not liking what I'm thinking in my head because I'm just like, are you kidding? Like, are you an idiot? Do you not know how to do this? Why are you asking me for this? And I, it was funny, I was having a discussion with a client the other day who actually is a believer, and we were just talking about, you know, in, in this day and age particularly, we need a lot of grace for people. And so, thankfully, God's kind of given me that grace. I'm not going to say I don't slip here and there and kind of lay into somebody, but um, it, it's, it's a, a way to, to think about, you know, exactly what Easter meant and what, what it meant when uh, Christ died for us and what it means that he rose. And what we're going to hear from Pastor Paul today is about this ability that we now have to live in Christ and to be able to have our, our spirit our God-given spirit overcome our flesh. Because I think, right, that's a battle we as, as human beings and as Christians we face every day is this flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit, uh, and who's going to prevail. And, and I really, uh, you know, what we believe, right, is that because of God's willingness to sacrifice his son and his willingness to basically have Christ take the punishment um, for what we've done, and, and it's His grace that it gives us the ability um, to live in Christ and to have uh, God's Spirit overcome our flesh. Um, so our worship service today, we begin with our call to worship, and it comes from Ephesians 2, 1 and 4 to 6, and it does talk about God's grace, and it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And that is such a good message for us, right? It's such a saving message for us that despite um, our fallen nature, we've been able to sit with Christ and God in heaven. So our confession also comes from um, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 2 to 3. The sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. So as we think about God's grace, let's just um, spend a moment silently confessing uh, those sins of our flesh, those, those acts and thoughts and deeds of our flesh, and um, just go to God and ask for his forgiveness.
Dear Father, uh, as we gather together this morning to worship you, we uh, lay our sins before you, um, the deeds and acts of our flesh, uh, whether it be anger or greed or uh, complaining or lust or um, covetousness. Lord, we know that um, if it were not for you, uh, we would be servants to our flesh. We would be bound to our flesh. Uh, we would uh, lose to uh, the flesh uh, every single time. But it is because of your love and your grace for us that we can abide in your Son, Jesus Christ, and overcome um, uh, the flesh and, and the things of this world. So we know that you are listening to our prayers this morning. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for uh, your forgiveness. And may uh, we continue to strive uh, to walk in your Son, Jesus Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Um, our assurance also comes from Ephesians chapter 4. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's stand together and worship God.
for light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. to save. Because of his grace and mercy, our debt is paid and we have new life in Christ. reached for me It's pulled me from the raging seas And I'm safe on the solid ground The Lord is my salvation darkness falls His strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun The Lord is my salvation Who is like the Lord our God
His grace will renew these days. Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid, and the victory. Lord Jesus, we praise and thank you for living among us. Walk beside your missionaries as they seek to proclaim the joy of your gospel. Cherish, guide and strengthen them. Help them to be patient when they meet frustrations and encourage them when they are disappointed. May they be true messengers of your word bringing your compassion and mercy to all who are poor and marginalised. Help me also 
to be a missionary of God's love. Amen. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Um, uh, this morning, I kind of want to talk about uh, who we are as we live in this world. And, um, you know, what we don't realize is that sometimes when we're living in this world, we're actually out of place. We kind of don't fit. Um, and when I talk about the world, I mean, you know, what Jesus talks about the world in John. John talks about being in the world but not of the world. You know, Jesus said, you know, I pray for you that the Lord God Father would not take us out of the world, but deliver us or keep us or protect us from the evil one. Um, but sometimes, sometimes people who are believers in Jesus um, struggle with temptation. And the truth is, there's a reality. And the reality is that before we become Christians and before we're saved, we really don't struggle. We don't have an inter internal battle between flesh and spirit. But once we're saved, there is an internal battle between flesh and our spirit. Because, you know, we have the old sinful nature and the new sinful nature. And sometimes people sort of fall. And how do they get back? Um, when I was pastor at the Korean Presbyterian Church and all these students from Washu and they were part of ACF, I, I used to see something every year. Um, and there were kind of three groups of freshmen. Um, there was one group of freshmen that would show up at the beginning of the year at September. And, you know, Korean churches tended to have like these little revivals at the end of summer for uh, high school students, you know, and the idea was, you know, let's get filled with the spirit and we'll make it through the year. Um, it, not necessarily work, but, you know, it's kind of helped them get focused. Uh, you know, so there were some, they show up, and then they just start to continue, and they are at church all year. There's another group that comes, um, and they're actually two-part. They come, and that first six, seven, eight weeks, they show up, they're real excited. You know, most went to Korean churches, English ministries up in Chicago, and we're really excited about being in church. And then there was a group that sort of after six, eight weeks, 12 weeks, they just would disappear from church and were like really hard to get a hold of. Um, and then part of them would come back about two years later. You know, why did they come back? Um, and this is sort of something that people that are going off into college need to kind of think about is they were required to be in the dormitory as freshmen. You go into the dormitory and what are a lot of college students doing in dorms on Friday, Saturday night? Um, you know, they're partying and there's a lot of drinking and, and, and of course, you know, experimenting with sexual immorality. Um, and some of them would fall into it. And then about two years later, they come back to church, but they're humbled. And what was really interesting about that particular group who sort of fell into sin because of living in the world of the dorms or what was going on is that if they came back, a lot of times they were much, much more aware of the reality of the gospel. Um, than people who are always sort of moralistic and faithful and never really sin because they have tasted the fact that they're sinners and they understand God's grace. Um, but so what I want to talk about is being in the world, how the world is full of temptations, that we often struggle with it, but then the question is how do you get out of being caught and trapped in bondage to worldly values and, and, and sinful behavior? And how do you return and have a deeper love for Jesus afterwards? And so, you know, this morning I want to talk about, you know, the title I put is Christ in me. And that's really grace. Grace is, um, in reality, grace in the book of Galatians is a definition of who we are in Christ, 
that we're not in Christ and with God because of legalism. We're in Christ because he has died. We have been united with him in his death, and we've been united with him in his resurrection. So when we sin, we have struggles. When we sin, unlike the people who are not Christians, people who are not Christians don't have struggles with morality generally. It's Christians who have struggles. So, you know, kind of understand that. It's a, it's a signal. It's like God sending warning shots to us. So, you know, here, um, I just two verses, and one of them is just from the opening of Galatians where he talks about grace and peace. Um, and grace and peace are really important. Um, grace and peace are very, very important. They're opening sort of greetings, but in reality... They also have theological meaning, and they have different meaning in different books. So what I want to say is grace and peace is really important as we open. So Paul opens up as he always does, and he says, grace and peace to you. And then notice what he does. From God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who delivered us from this present evil age. And present evil age is very similar to kind of what John or Jesus will talk about being in the world but not of the world. He has delivered us from this present evil age. Then, in the next chapter, towards the end, is probably one of the neatest verses in the entire Bible. Because what Paul says is true of all of us who are true believers. Um, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And I want you to see this tension. I do not live. Christ lives in me. But the flesh, I, uh, the, the life I now live in the flesh. So here's this weird thing. I no longer live, but the life I now live. And, and the secret there is Christ in me. And that's the power of grace. Christ in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And how did he prove his love for me? And this is important because if we ever fall into sin and struggles and we relearn the gospel and we relearn God's grace, we also are relearning God's love in a new way. Um, And how? The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. So the cross is actually God's sign to the world, bellowing out to all of us, God loves us, and we see it in the cross. Let me pray quickly and ask God to kind of help me to speak faithfully. Almighty God, I do pray to you, and I ask you that you would be with each and every one of us, and I pray that the message, God, would be faithful to your word. I pray that you would speak through me, but I also pray, God, that we would set these words aside. You know, whether to help live in your love and in your grace now or in the past or even for the future, God, when, you know, some of us struggle and we learn, you know, who Jesus Christ is for the first time, and I should say, in a new time and in a new way. And um, I ask God that you would speak in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Um, You know, a great thing about America are birds. Um, And as you may know, there are migrations every year. Um, And we see here, you know, there's certain kind of geese. You know, the ducks fly south, and we all see that, and then they fly back north, and we all see that. And a lot of us see Canada geese. Uh, It's not Canadian geese, it's Canada geese. And they have that little ring around the neck. But there's another kind of a geese called snow geese. And and it's kind of real interesting, because they all have this, like, little black tip. Um, And they fly down way up from the north of Canada, and they're flying down south for the wintertime. There is in uh, Montana uh, a handful of lakes. Um, You know, they fly down from the north, and sometimes they'll fly 500, 1,000 miles, and then they get to some lakes that are in Montana, and then they land. And they rest for a little while, and while they are resting, you know, they're also drinking water and rehydrating. Um, And in Butte, Montana, there's a couple of places, and and one of them is called Freeze Out Lake, 
And normally, it doesn't really freeze. It's like the last thing to freeze. I don't know why they call it freeze out lake, but it's one of the last lakes to freeze. There's another place that does not freeze, and it's a mine. Um, it's called Berkeley Pit. Um, and Berkeley Pit, I think of as being similar to the world that we live in, in terms of we live in a world that is full of temptation to sin, and as we live in a world that is full of temptation to sin, if we stay in the world and we are not kind of warned by God about it, and we're not listening to God speak to us in his conviction, we can fall into deep sin. Um, and it can be dangerous for us. And so birds sometimes come and they fly. And on a few occasions, on a few occasions, freeze out lake freezes very, very early, and then all of those snow geese instead go to Berkeley Lake or Berkeley Pit. The problem with Berkeley Pit is very similar to the world. If you go to Freeze Out Lake, it's a beautiful place to stay. If that is frozen and you end up going to the world of Berkeley Pit, it's a very dangerous place to be. Um, why? Why? Let me just kind of go back a bit. Um, if, if you look at Berkeley Pit, it is a mine which has mine shafts, but it's also a big pit. And so at one time, they dug this big, huge, open mine to get copper, but then it closed in 1982. And then as it closed in 1982, it slowly filled with water, and they were no longer pumping water out of the mine shafts. And then in 1995, Suddenly, they found about 300 or 400 snow geese dead floating on the water. Why? Because there's a lot of heavy metal in it. So the acid, acidity is really high, but they have arsenic, they have cadmium, and, a, and several other heavy metals. And so when birds land, when the geese land, and they rest in the water, and they sit in the water, just like if we spend too much time in the world and worldly temptations, if they spend too much time, the acid that's in the water and the heavy metals, the arsenic and the cadmium, will kill them. It'll burn their feathers, but then they drink the water and it kills them. So you kind of can't stay too long. And so what they have done to protect these geese, especially after 2016, when there was about 10,000 geese that landed in the area, and then on one day, one day, I'm just telling you, one day, they found three to 4,000 geese that were dead. Three to 4,000 geese that died in one day. So they decided, well, how do we protect them? It's like, how does God protect us? And what they decided to do is, you know, they can't go out into the water with boats and chase them away because the, the acid and the metals will kind of rot and corrode the propellers and the boats don't work. So they set this thing way up on top of the hill and they have like three or four ways to protect the geese. One is they get a rifle. You know, you can kind of see that guy right here. And they just shoot down, not to hunt the geese, but shoot around the geese, and then the geese take off and fly. That protects them. It's like a warning shot from God. You know, another thing that they do is they have this big, huge air cannon that they shoot, and they, it kind of is a big explosion, and then the geese take off and they fly away. A third thing they do, which I think is really fun, is they have these drones, and then they have these drones, and then they fly over the geese to chase them away. It's just like God. When we are in the world... If we stay in the world too long and it matches up, or it sort of pulls its temptations that match up with our flesh, our sinful desires, and if we fall into it, and if we think that we can stay in sin for a while, God sometimes sends warning shots. And if we don't listen, we can sort of die spiritually just like the geese do. So I kind of want to open up, and I, you know, Paul here, he talks about grace and grace in this book is over and against legalism. Grace in the book of Galatians is over and against 
justification by works or works righteousness. You know, where you do things because of what you do, you prove yourself to be righteous before God, but then end up you try to, are trying to prove yourself to be more righteous than other people. And that's just pride. It is about grace, and that is justification and being made righteous before God because of what Jesus did on the cross. And grace is Jesus living inside of us, giving us the power to overcome sin. And it's because we're united with him. And that's what peace is. It says grace and peace to you. And the peace is actually in the book of Galatians, I think. Is connected with chapter 5. Because in chapter 5, it describes this conflict, this battle. We have the spirit. We have the flesh. They're at war with each other. And then there's the deeds of the flesh. And then the fruit of the spirit. And so there's this war that's going on. And if we are really walking in Christ and allowing Christ to work, rather than our own sanctified flesh, God sets us free. It's by grace you're saved, but it's by grace that you're also rescued out of sin. And then he goes on to say, who is it from? It's from God the Father. The Father loves us. And secondly, it's from our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, that is kurios. The Greek word is kurios, and it's the word in the Greek Old Testament to translate Yahweh, God. So, you know, I think that Yahweh is actually proven to be Jesus in how Paul uses it. Secondly, it's our Lord Jesus, Jesus Yeshua, which, of course, we may know means Yahweh saves, the Lord saves us. And then finally, he's the Messiah. You know, and it says in Greek, Christos, but Christos is just the word for Messiah. And he's the Messiah for all of God's people. He is our king. You've got to hear that. King. And because we are citizens of the kingdom of God, and because we are citizens of the kingdom of God, when we fall into sin, our king will come and rescue us. And we have to live in that grace. So first of all, I kind of want to talk about a couple of things. that He rescues us from this evil age. And part of the way that he does it is he crucifies us to the world. Secondly, secondly, we are crucified with Christ, which means we become dead to our sin. And what that means is we can't stay in sin very long. It may feel really good to begin with, but eventually we become miserable. And when we become miserable in sin, that's great. And then thirdly, we are united with Jesus Christ, raised up with him, and because we're raised up with him, we're alive in him. And then Christ lives in us and Christ loves us. And so the first point here is that Jesus Christ, because of what he did on the cross, and when God saves us, when he regenerates us, when he causes us to be born again, what does he do? It says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave himself for our sins. Okay, that's right. We got that all right. He died, pays the penalty for our sin, and then we're forgiven. But notice there's something else here. He gives a purpose. He says the reason that Jesus gave himself for our sins is to deliver us or to rescue us from this evil age. You know, what does he mean by evil age? Throughout the New Testament, it repeatedly talks about two ages. There's this age now and the age to come. There's not three ages. There's not four ages. There's two. This age and the age to come. That's how Jesus describes it. That's how Paul describes it. There's this age and the age to come. What is this age? I don't think this age is talking about the time period. Because what he's doing is he's saying this present evil age. And I think that this is very similar to what Jesus and John say in terms of the world. The world. Worldly values is how we sometimes think about it. World is a world of temptation to sin. World is what it is where Satan is kind of ruling and kind of leads and draws us into temptation of various kinds of sin for a number of reasons and a number of ways that we end up becoming rescued from that. So what does Jesus say? I pray that you will not take them out of this world, but that you will protect them from the evil one. So we live in this world but we're protected. That's what God is praying. Jesus is praying that we will be protected from the evil one. Right before Jesus died, when he's looking at the cross, he says, now the Son of Man is glorified. But then he goes on to say that as he is glorified on the cross, the ruler of this world, the ruler of this age is cast down. 
So this age is an age where it's the world and it's a system and it's a culture that changes from one culture to another and it changes from one period of history to another. But in essence, it's a world that is a system that is opposed to God and a system that is opposed to Christ and God's ways and God's ways. So we live in this world. So we get born again and it says he has delivered us, but we still live in the world. We're still trapped with it. We're still stuck with it. And this is kind of very difficult because now we have a struggle that the people around us do not have. Um, and a way to think about it is who's in control and who is the ruling. Who's in control and who's ruling? We're either a slave to Christ or we're a slave to sin. A slave to Christ or a slave to sin. Who's ruling us? So what Paul, I think a good way to look at how Paul describes this is he says it in a different way in Colossians. He says, God the Father, he has transferred us, or I should say he has delivered us. He's delivered us and then transferred us. He has delivered, he's rescued us from this domain of darkness domain where there's kind of a ruler and there's a reign where there's sort of a king the prince of the power of the air the ruler of this world satan he's delivered us from that and darkness the domain of darkness is where evil reigns and evil is not something that people in the world understand this is evil as defined by god's word the bible but he says, we have been transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son. See, Jesus Christ is ruling. So we have been transferred, but we're still here. And so we're straddling two worlds. Just like we have remnants of the flesh, but we have died. And we have the spirit and we have the flesh. We also have the world, the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness, where we still live in this world, and there's the kingdom of the sun. And so we're out of place. We are out of place. Those college students that I talked about, that I would see, they would disappear for two years. Sometimes people disappear for three years. Sometimes people disappear from the Lord for 10, 15, 20 years. But if they're born again, they always have the sense of feeling out of place. They always, so what ends up happening with these college students? Uh, what I have seen on a number of occasions is you go off, you get sucked into the party scene with all of the drinking, and then you start getting into the sexual immorality, and there's all kinds of things, but they feel miserable. There's something, it's pleasurable at first. It's pleasurable at first, but then at some point, God sends his warning shots, and his warning shots sometimes are he makes us feel miserable when we're living in sin. So then at some point we feel empty and we feel dead. Um, you know, we're always a little out of place. And that's really kind of important. When I was in the army, you know, I, I, you know, I don't talk about it much, but you guys know, you know, I spent four years active army in Georgia and in Germany when Sandy and I were married, and then another three years in the Army Reserves. Um, and, and so, you know, I, kind of, I joined for two reasons. One is I felt like, you know, if you're going to serve your country and be patriotic, you need to serve. Um, I, I'll just tell you a pet peeve of mine. Um, a pet peeve of mine is I, I really get upset when I hear people who did not serve in the military question or criticize the patriotism of somebody who did serve. I, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hypocritical. It, it's, it kind of irritates me, but that's a side issue. But, but when I was in the army, it was really interesting because I felt out of place almost the whole entire time. And there's a few reasons. One, you know, I joined and enlisted, and the reason I joined and enlisted was very selfish. I was tired of working three jobs to get through college, and what I wanted to do was get money to pay for college. I wanted to get money to pay for graduate school. So I'm a little older, and I'm married, and I had at twice, twice, I had to live in the barracks. Um, you know, for several months that I was in, 
And then the first few months that I was in Germany, and, and being in Germany, I just felt so out of place, and being actually in the barracks were so out of place. Why was I out of place? One, I was older. Two, I had some college education, and a lot of these people didn't. A lot were actually just kids that grew up in the South, and in the South, they consider it to be you know, a patriotic duty. It's a tradition that you serve in the military. And then three, you know, I, I was married. But there was, it took me time. I realized that the real reason that I felt out of place was because I was a Christian. You know, when you're a Christian, you feel out of place in the world. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, there are times when we should feel out of place in this world. Because, like, when I went to Germany, I had several things that happened. You know, I had a roommate, Froggy, and, and he would go out and party. Um, Froggy was the first man that I ever knew that had AIDS or HIV AIDS. And then suddenly he was taken away. Nicest kid in the world, 18 years old. But, you know, he actually was, you know, hanging around the gay bar scene in Germany. And that he contracted AIDS at a very early date, uh, you know, before they had ways to solve it. And he died. But, you know, it's not just that. It's, it's that there were guys and even married men that, you know, when their spouses were at home, what were they doing? It just felt so weird. You know, they would go out and they would drink and they would go to bars and they would chase women and they would take women to hotels, you know, and I, it just, I felt out of place. We should always somewhat feel out of place in this world because in some ways we really don't belong. So if you feel out of place and it's because of who we are as believers in Christ and the world system, and it doesn't matter whether it's in a college dormitory or in the army or in our business place or our neighbors. You know, there's a way in which we're not part of this world. Jesus has come to deliver us out of it. Um, and he's actually explains why the world and worldly values can leave us feeling empty, can leave us feeling dead, can leave us feeling miserable. Because what he says is, you know, at the end of Galatians, I don't glory in anything. I only glory in one thing. I glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's sort of like saying, I'm determined to know nothing among you except for Christ and him crucified. It's not that he's ignorant and not that he only wants to talk about that, but it's his crucifixion and who he is and his resurrection is what it is that determines who we are. That we are united with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. But he talks about being crucified. There, you know, there are three crucifixions. And he says this. He says, the world has been crucified to me. So, so the worldly system against God is crucified to me, so I'm a little bit out of place. I, I never really fit anymore. Secondly, he says, I am crucified to the world. And what that means is that we don't really feel pleasure being in the world. We don't really belong. We're there, we love people, but as Jesus said, I pray that you would not take them out of the world, but I pray that you would protect them from the evil one. So there's a third crucifixion, and that is the world is crucified to me. I am crucified to the world, and my old sinful nature is crucified. So there's a way in which we never can live long in sin. When we are tempted and we fall into sin, God will send warning shots. I sort of feel like, you know, we have to be aware. It's just like at Berkeley Pitt. I kind of think, you know, when I read this article and I thought, you know, these guys are standing there and the snow geese, they don't understand the water that they're going into. They don't understand that the water is poisonous. They don't understand that the water can kill them because of the heavy metals and the um, acidity. But what do they do? Department of Natural Resources, they set up this whole system. They built like this little tower up above and then they have these guys and they man it all throughout the, the periods of the, of the migrations and they're doing one, two, three, four thing. They're firing off air cannons with these big, huge explosions. You know, they sit there with a rifle and they fire down around the geese to protect them. They send drones over them. You know, and I think, you know, this is just like if we fall into sin, God will bring a crisis into our lives to wake us up. That's the air cannon. 
the firing. Sometimes it's like this little shot, something little around us that just kind of wakes us up, get out of sin. Sometimes God brings a person into our lives and it's like the little drone hovering around us, you know, and it's kind of pesty, but the truth is it's God's way of reminding us, get out of the water of sin and return to Christ. The truth is, though, sometimes people who fall into sin and get out of it, sometimes those are the people who know and understand the gospel more than other people. Because they have experienced grace in a way that other people have not. They know that they're sinners in a way that righteous people do not know. They understand the entire gospel. Secondly, we've been crucified with Christ. That's how, why we can't sin. That's why we become miserable with sin. You know, and, and we become dead with sin, and then we're raised with sin. So we're crucified with Christ, and we're raised with him. You know, and here what he says is, you know, as he opens this up, and then he gets down to to that verse 220, that one that we should all memorize. I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ is crucified, when we become believers, at the moment we become believers, it's like our old sinful nature is killed, our old Adam. And it is no longer I who live. So it's that, it's not that I'm not here, it's not that my personality is not here, it's that old sinful nature is dead. And then it's replaced. Christ lives in me. That's the hope. Christ lives in me. That's the hope. It's not in our own righteousness. It's not in the things that we do. It's Christ inside of us. And then the way to kind of understand this is to go back to Romans 6. And, you know, the teens looked at Romans 6 the other day, and we looked at, you know, being slaves to sin or being slaves to Christ. But, you know, what we kind of missed was a little bit earlier in the chapter which is really important because, you know, how is it that we're not slaves to sin, but we become slaves to Christ, is the crucifixion that we have. We are crucified with Christ. But it says in Romans, it says the old Adam is crucified with Christ. If your Bible says the old self, I understand why they write that, but it's actually inappropriate. Because the word is actually the old Adam, the old man. And in chapter 5, the whole chapter 5, the second half of chapter 5, is about the first Adam and the second Adam. And then he says, our old Adam has been crucified with Christ. So our sinful nature is cru crucified. And we no longer are united to Adam. We are now united to Christ. It's killed. That's why it's so hard to sin and continue to sin. That's why people end up feeling miserable and return to Christ. Because it just doesn't feel good any longer. But then there's a hope. And the hope is, he goes on to say, I've been crucified with Christ. That old Adam has died. But, but, we have been buried with him. That old self is actually buried in the death of Jesus Christ and in his burial, but there's a second half of it, and the second half of it is so important and so crucial. It is the most important thing that we need to know, and that is that as we have died with Christ, it says, as Christ was raised from the dead, we too walk in the newness of life. So Christ is always giving us the opportunity to live in the newness of life. When kids come back from spending two years in the dorms, partying, engaging in sex, and then suddenly in their sexual immorality or whatever sin it is that we have, we become humbled. You know, we learn, these kids, they learn the gospel in a way that they never would have learned it if they hadn't fallen. Because suddenly the gospel is theirs. It's no longer their parents. It's theirs. But we walk in the newness of life. We always have hope for the newness of life, to walk in it. Um, and furthermore, oh, I've got to get this. We're alive in Christ. Um, and this is really where the union with Christ leads us. So when you fall, if you fall... If you ever fall, if you ever have fallen in the past, you have to grasp this hope because our flesh has no ability to please God. 
our works and deeds have no ability whatsoever to make ourselves right before God. Christ does. Our righteousness before God is being from our union with him. And sometimes people try to get out of sin by depending upon themselves. Sometimes they think, if I just do enough, I can make up for sin. You can never, ever, ever make up for sin. What you can do is remember that you are united with Christ and that Christ lives in me, Christ lives in you, and the life that I now live, the life that you now live, if you are a believer in Jesus, the life that you live in this human flesh, you live by faith in the Son of God. So when you fall into sin, if you ever do, and I don't care what kind of sin, you know, it could be sexual immorality, it could be greed, it could be idolatry, it could be pride, it could be slander, it could be gossip, you know, it could be a million and one things, you know, could be greed, it could be all kinds of things. We all have different sins. But when we become aware of it, our hope is to realize that we are united with Christ and the power to come out of sin is actually Christ living inside of us. Um, and finally, Christ loves us. And this is the single most important thing for those who ever fall. Because if we ever fall, you feel insecure the rest of your life. When we fall into sin, people end up coming back to God, but then they become feeling insecure. And we have to understand all of those sins were paid for on the cross. When we repent and we return to God, all of the sins that we have had, they're gone. They're cast as far as the east is from the west. They're as far away from us as the heavens are from the earth. That's what the psalmists say. But we have to really grasp not only that Christ is in us that gives us the power to overcome sin, temptation, and to come back to God after we've fallen, but it's his love. So Christ loved me. How do I know it? He gave himself for me, or as he says in Romans 5, just before he's going to talk about the old, the old Adam and the new Adam, what does he say? He says, God showed his love for us. How did God show his love for us? How do I know that God shows his love for us? If I have fallen into sin and I try to return to God and I'm always feeling insecure and I'm always feeling like I'll never do enough, you have to give up on trying to do enough. You have to work on trying to walk with Christ in the Spirit, and you've got to cling to the cross. You've got to cling to the cross. Why? You know, why did Paul care about this? You have to remember, Paul was guilty of beating men and women and throwing them into jail because they believed in Jesus. You've got to remember, why is it that Paul is talking about the love of Christ? Because he voted to have people put to death. He thinks of himself as a murderer. He thinks of himself as a blasphemer. He is, always has this thing over his head. If you think that you have sinned, you've got to understand, Paul thinks that he is the worst sinner in the entire world. And what you got to do is do exactly what Paul did. And that is to say that God shows his love for me, and I am always going to be secure. I will always be secure for one reason and one reason alone. And that is because while we were still sinners, and when we sin again and again, and again, and we fall into sin one more time. It doesn't matter how many times. You've got to go back to Jesus Christ and realize that God loves for you, and he proved it when he died on the cross. Your only hope is the greatest hope there is. Your only hope is one and one alone. I don't care whether it's sexual immorality. I don't care whether it's anger or bitterness. I don't care whether it's slander or sin. I don't care whether or not, you know, you're into all kinds of alcohol or whatever the sins may be. At some point, God will open them up to us and your only hope, but it is the greatest hope in the entire world, is that while you are sinners and while I am a sinner, Christ showed his love for us 
and that he died for us. And the way to overcome sin and temptation is not a four point. Let me give you three or four points of practical suggestions. No, that's not what the Bible does. What the Bible does is he says, if you know who you are in Christ, that's how you overcome temptation. That's how you get out of sin. Because you are united with Jesus Christ. So what he ends up saying is that when we are in battle, and we are in battle, those non-believers do not have a battle within them. They belong in the world. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. So we always have an internal battle with temptation. They just live in the flesh. In the sinful, rebellious flesh. We live in the flesh... But it's been crucified, it's dead, but it keeps trying to raise its ugly head. But we are also united with Christ and we have the Spirit. So we always have a battle, an internal battle. That's the peace that comes. It's actually the battle between the flesh and the Spirit that is inside of us. We always have it. But the way to get out is simple. It, it's not that, let me give you three, four, five practical, practical suggestions. It's really this. The world is full of temptation and we have to know it. The world is full of temptation, but we don't really fit because we've been crucified. We're dead to the world and the worldly values. So when we try to live according to worldly values with the people around us, we end up feeling miserable and out of place. Secondly, when we do fall, God is always there and he sends warning shots, if you will. He sends his little drones of Christian friends that kind of harass us, you know, and you know, they're not meaning to harass us, they're just around us, and we kind of feel guilty, but, you know, those are really God's angels, if you will. Not real angels, but people. You know, the little crises that have happened to wake us up. Um, secondly, we are dead to the sinful nature. That is why when we fall into sin and we are miserable... It is a great sign because only people that are united with Jesus Christ feel miserable in sin. When you feel miserable, if you've fallen into sin, that is from God. Um, and then finally, the way back is to remember Christ lives inside of us. That's the power to overcome our sin and temptation. And we've got to remember where our security is. Our security is in one thing and one thing alone, and that is that Jesus Christ loves us as he proved it on the cross. Um, keep those in mind. Let me pray. Um, God Almighty, we um, are sinners. We have been sinners. Um, we sin in a million and one ways. But you've also put to death our sinful nature, and you've also put to death the world. And I pray, God, that you would always remind us, God, whether it's big, big, you know, supposedly big sins or the little sins. I pray, Father God, that you will always be there to remind us and you will always be there to rescue us. And I pray that you will always keep us safe from the ways of the world and that you will always rescue us, God, from our own sin and give us your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand. Let's sing this song in response to the message that we've just heard. We've been crucified with Christ and raised with him. Because of his amazing love, we're alive in Christ and we can walk in the newness of life. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me.
joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were Because you have been crucified with Christ and buried, but have been made alive with Christ, and you walk in the newness of life, may you this week be sensitive to the Spirit's working in your life, and may you really shine with the gospel of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Pastor Paul, for that uh, really powerful message. You know, there have been times in, in, in my life where I feel like I'm, you know, playing dodgeball with God because he's, like, taking those shots at us. And I guess that's a good thing, right? Problem is, now I'm old, I can't play that dodgeball anymore. So God just hits me full on. He never misses. Um, but thank you. And, and it is truly a blessing, right, in, in ways we can't even comprehend that that God sacrificed his son for us. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a daily, a daily battle that we have to face uh, living in this world and not being of the world. So thanks for that message, Pastor Paul. Um, before announcements, anybody visiting us for the first time or second time or haven't been here in a while, if you don't mind, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if you don't mind introducing yourself, we'd love to get to know you and say hi. Anybody? I saw some finger pointing, but I'm not going to point them out. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining with us. A couple quick announcements. Um, we still have the, uh, the playground uh, project going on, but I think as Tim announced last week, we're, uh, we're going to, I think, groundbreaking is soon, right? They're going to start if they haven't. 
Um, but next week, the kids um, are doing something really exciting. We're going to have a little uh, uh, marketplace uh, where the kids have, I think, got, gathered, done some crafts or gathered some other things, baked some goods. Um, it'll be right out in the uh, uh, gym afterwards. And it's just to raise money to kind of uh, close that gap uh, for the playground. Um, secondly, and this is really exciting, um, for those of us who've been in the, well, we, we have our church retreat coming up uh, Memorial Day weekend, uh, uh, which we haven't done in a couple years because of COVID. And this year we were supposed to have Greg Speck come speak to us, who's, who's spoken to us before, a great speaker. But unfortunately, we found out last week he had a really uh, bad, broke his leg really bad and, and wasn't going to make it. And we're trying to scramble and, you know, who can we get at this short notice uh, to come speak at the retreat because, you know, we hear from our pastors every week. We don't want to hear from them for four days in a row. No offense. Um, but for those of us who've been here for a long time, you're going to remember this name and we're really excited. Um, how many people remember Chad and Debbie Anderson? Everybody that was in teens back in those days. They were probably, I think, were they our first youth workers from Covenant? And um, it was, they were husband and wife, and, and they went to Covenant and um, just set a really high uh, bar for our teen ministry. And, and we are uh, so fortunate and so blessed that they were able to come on such uh, short notice. Uh, if you go to the church's uh, Facebook page, um, Debbie looks the exact same. Chad just looks older and balder and whatever, but um, they've got a couple kids now, um, and we're really excited. So if you haven't registered for the retreat yet, we'd really encourage you uh, to do that. We're really excited uh, to hear from uh, uh, Chad and Debbie. Um, and I think that's it. The rest of the announcements um, are in your bulletin. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning, and just meditate and reflect for a minute before we're dismissed on just really uh, how great, as we just sang, you know, God's love is for us. Thanks and have a great week.